Well, hello everyone, and uh, thank you for coming. Um, I'll try to make this talk as interactive as possible, so if you have questions during the uh, talk and if you see any images that you don't understand or whatever questions might come up, feel free to interrupt me. Um, we'll talk about uh, coronary artery disease briefly and what tests we use about diagnosing heart disease and we'll also talk about the heart as a whole because we don't have only arteries in our heart but we have valves, there is a lot of muscle involved. I will briefly touch a little bit with regards to physiology of the heart, etc. And as I said, if you have any questions in between, feel free to interrupt me. Um, so as Dr. Spratt mentioned, uh, coronary artery disease is the number one medical problem that we are facing in our days. Um, is the number one killer in the United States. Um, the rates of coronary artery disease in the rest of the world, especially East Europe and East Asia, used to be a lot lower. But as those countries are becoming wealthier and they are eating more, and we, the westernized world, are sending more goods over there, those countries are developing a lot more and their rates of coronary artery disease are increasing tremendously, even at a faster rate than in the United States or Western Europe. So with regards to America, in 2008 alone, I don't have the most up-to-date, the 2010 data, but they don't look very different from the 2008 data. In 2008, over more than 600,000 people died of heart disease. Heart in the U.S., we're talking specifically about the United States. Heart disease caused almost 25% of deaths. So one in four deaths in the United States was because of heart disease. Coronary artery disease is the most common type of heart disease. And in 2008, 405 people died from coronary artery disease. 600 people of heart-related issues two-thirds of that specifically from coronary artery disease. Every year about 785,000 Americans have a first heart attack and almost 500,000 in addition to that almost 800,000 number have their second or third heart attack. Numbers are staggering. In 2010, heart disease alone was projected to cost the United States almost $110 billion in healthcare related costs from services, medications, and productivity, or hours of work lost. So I don't think that I can make these numbers any more convincing. It's a major problem, number one problem in America. We take it seriously. We as physicians take it seriously. You as customers, patients, friends, family members should take it seriously. Um, two words about the anatomy of the heart. As I said, we as cardiologists need to look at the heart as a whole. It's not just one single problem. When we talk about coronary artery disease and we see a blocked artery somewhere in the heart, it's not that that problem affects that specific dot in the heart. Atherosclerotic disease is a systemic disease. If you have it in the heart, you very likely have it elsewhere in the aorta, in the kidneys, in the brain, in the carotids, elsewhere, especially maybe in the legs, etc. Um, also, if a patient has a heart attack, that heart attack that starts with a blocked artery somewhere here in the surface of the heart might cause muscle damage, and that muscle damage can complicate the rest of the pumping function of the heart and might compromise the way that these valves, these white little thin leaflets in here work. When a heart attack happens, the heart increases in size, parts of the heart muscle become weaker. When the heart pumps one muscle, one part of the heart muscle comes in, the other one goes away instead of squeezing together. So then we see leaky valves. And those are problems that need to be addressed on their own. And as I mentioned, coronary artery disease, if it affects one coronary artery disease, one of these vessels in here, very, very likely it happens elsewhere. It might affect the aorta, which is one of the main branches, or the main branch that sends the blood from the heart, being the pump elsewhere and everywhere in our body. If you have atherosclerotic disease in the aorta and little particles or little clots or emboli 
you know, get dislodged from the aorta, they can go elsewhere, like the brain, and cause stroke, like the kidneys, and cause kidney failure, like the legs, and cause, you know, clots or blockages of arteries in the legs as well. Moving on, um, I am sure that all of you have heard about the electrocardiograms, or ECG. A uh, little picture in here, nowadays what we do, we connect a computer, which is the ECG machine, or the electrocardiogram machine, with a cable with about, most of the time, with 12 electrodes in the patient's chest, shoulders or arms, and the legs. I am sure that many of you have seen this. And what we get out of this is actually where, where this ECG started was somewhere around the early 1900s. From Netherlands, Dr. Eindhoven built this machine. Now, don't ask me how this machine worked, okay? <laughs> Quite complex. But somewhere around uh, 1911, he started experimenting with himself and his own team and needed I don't know how many people to get this machine running with voltage and measuring the, the electrical potentials that were generated in a, in a person, in a human body, and registering them on a piece of paper. And this piece of paper on your right side, this strip in here is actually generated from this machine and was pretty close, I would say, with the strips that we get nowadays. So the technology has evolved, but the potentials, you know, again, we are registering something similar to what Dr. Einhoven was doing. Interesting stuff, right? 100 years ago. So nowadays we have, you know, improved our algorithms. The EKG machines have, you know, shrunk in size. Now we use 12 electrodes instead of three et cetera, et cetera. And the amount of information that we can extract from one electrocardiogram is tremendous, I'd say. There are many books that can be like 500 pages thick that talk only about this. And different arrhythmias, different irregularities, possible, you know, heart damage that a patient might have had. Um, and as I mentioned, we can extract a lot of information just from an electrocardiogram. <coughs> Very simple, easy, non-invasive test gives us a tremendous amount of information. Moving on, EKG is too simple for cardiologists. We go to school, we do three years of training just focusing on cardiology, and we always learn about the echocardiograms. Very valuable tool. It essentially, what it does, it takes pictures of the heart and it tells us in real time how the heart is pumping, how the heart muscle is moving. Are there any signs of weaknesses? how the valves are opening and closing in the heart. Is there any leakage in there? Is the heart relaxing normally? Is the heart contracting normally? We can also image with the same machine parts of the aorta, and we can measure the size, how big the aorta is. Is it bigger? Is it smaller? Is there thickening in there? Is there any dissection, or is there any problems with the walls of the aorta? Is there any splitting of those walls, like dissections, et cetera? Moving on, go ahead. You said based on ultrasound? Ultrasound. The technology, actually, we'd like to borrow, you know, information and technology and whatever IT brings to us, of course. But actually, the technology is borrowed from submarines, okay? The United States Army uses submarines, as you know. And what they do, I'm sure you have heard a ping signal that they release. And that ping signal goes forward and, you know, can spread if it, you know, hits no, no object. But if it hits an object, that ping signal returns back. And all you need is an antenna. So the physicians and the physicists and engineers thought, hmm, good idea. What if I send a signal through the body? Would I be able to get an image? And that's exactly what they do. At the very tip, or the probe right here on this gentleman's hand. It used to be one crystal and one antenna. Now there are at least 256 crystals to improve the image and make that image pretty and you know, visible to us. So we can see through those 256 sig uh, crystals that send that ping and we capture it through multiple antennas. We see the images in the computer in real time. 
and as I said, gives us information about how the heart moves, are there any weaknesses, is there any leakage, is there any damage, etc. And when we look, you know, this is the heart muscle, and this exactly same image, and I have a few more pictures as I go through, a similar image is projected as is seen and is seen in the computer screen. So this is what we see. This is the left ventricle or the left main chamber. This is the right ventricle or the right main chamber. This is the left atrium. Right here in between this thing that opens and closes, in between the left ventricle and the left atrium, is the mitral valve. On the other side, right here, is the tricuspid valve, and this is the right atrium, this is the right ventricle. To a trained eye, somebody will bring up, or a cardiologist might say, hey, what is this? This bright spot in here looks like a foreign object. Well, actually it is. This is a defibrillator wire, pacemaker defibrillator wire. And this same patient that I mentioned, this echocardiogram is from 2009. 57-year-old woman, known coronary artery disease, a rhythm problem that we saw on the electrocardiogram that we did, showing lead bundle branch block, had heart failure. She presented with shortness of breath, weight gain, swelling on the legs, not feeling well, exercise tolerance was no higher than a flight of stairs or one block. He was in bad shape. 57, I'd say she's young, and she was in trouble. If you look at her echocardiogram from 2009, this wall and this wall are essentially not coming together. They just like move very little. And if you were to measure the size of this chamber or this ventricle, is big or enlarged. I don't have the Doppler images. If you look at this round shape, this is like, you know, taking pictures of the heart across, okay? But if you see in here, it's not pumping well, it's not moving well. If you look at this image, this wall and this wall are just moving slightly, but they don't come together as they are supposed to. And what we call ejection fraction or pumping function of the heart on this image is, is about 30% at best, which is severely decreased. How do you we eyeball it, and you would say, hmm, that's crazy, <laughs> right? Well, even if you were to use the more advanced, and we have, you know, me many measurements that we use and, em you know, employ when we do echocardiograms, there are many rules and calculations and measurements that we do other than just eyeballing it. But to our surprise, even if you you know, bring medical students that are at the very beginning of their career and you tell them this is what it is 30 percent, this is 50 percent, this is 60 or 70 percent. Just eyeballing it, even they become very good within one month. So you can train your eye and your eye can become so accurate that it's very comparable with the computer. But we always compare the computer with what we think and do they match to bring in the most accurate, you know, information, of course. So, as I said, this woman was very symptomatic in 2009. We started treating her, and with our interventions, etc., the pumping function, look at this side, and this is the echocardiogram from 2009. It barely moves. The ejection fraction here is about, as I said, 30%. Look at the pumping function in here. Look at this walls, how they come together. I'm putting the pointer right in the middle. You see how they come together much better? So her ejection fraction within a couple of years with our intervention and the pacemaker and the medication, etc., actually improved to 50%. Now she can climb two flights of stairs carrying her laundry, etc., etc., and she feels much better. Another study that employs, you know, or uses the same computer, the same software, etc., but the difference is on the probe that we use. It's called transesophageal echocardiogram. It's like going to a gastroenterologist and the gastroenterologist goes with the camera through the mouth into the food pipe and gets closer to the heart because the heart is very close or, you know, next to the esophagus. If the esophagus is a tube, the heart sits next to it. Rather than going through the chest, the heart muscle, the ribs, 
the lungs and the air in the lungs, which deteriorates the image quality, we do the transit of geo echocardiogram. And we are able to get better images that way. <clears throat> we do that to look for clots within the heart, and we mainly do it uh, to look at the valves, how the valves are functioning. Are they stenotic or narrowed? Are they leaking? To what degree? And sometimes, if we cannot get <coughs> excuse me, any good images through the transthoracic echo, but our level of suspicion is high, to avoid all those layers, because when we grow, we tend to grow insulation in here on the chest wall as well, we use the transesophageal echocardiogram. Someone had a question? Yes. Um, I was told that I have four leaking valves. Mm -hmm. Well, it all, de it all depends on the severity of, of how bad those leaky valves are. And four are, you know, essentially on all the valves of your heart, you have a degree of leakage. Okay. You know? Yeah. Now, if, if it's just a tiny leakage, a small thing, we tend to monitor without, you know, doing anything else. But this is a good question to discuss with your cardiologist. Should I have a TEE done or it's not necessary? What blood? The leaks? So, so, these are all the valves. This is the tricuspid valve, this is the mitral, this is the pulmonic, and this is the aortic right here. So, the valve, everything that is blue in here, it means that it's in the vein. Okay? And from the right side of the heart goes into the lungs where it extracts oxygen and excretes the CO2. Drops the garbage, picks up the nutrients, right? And then from the lungs, goes back into the left side of the heart. And when the left side of the heart pumps, it goes into all our organs, brain everywhere else, okay? Now when the valves are leaking, if you have, depending on which valve is leaking, that blood can go in the aorta, go in the aorta, and then come back through the aortic valve into the left ventricle. And if the left ventricle needs to, you know, pump and throw, let's say, 50 cc's or about, you know, half glass of blood into the aorta, some of it comes back and some of it comes from the lungs and becomes overloaded with that volume. And over the years, the heart can enlarge because of that leakage. Now, if that leakage, as I said, is just mild, is no big deal. But if that leakage is severe, of course, it is a big deal because patients can become short of breath. The heart might, you know, not work as, as it's supposed to or not as well as it's supposed to. And if there is increased resistance and pressure into the lungs, it can make you short of breath. So this is the transit of a GL echocardiogram. Essentially an echocardiogram and the images are generated through a probe through the food pipe. Let's move on and switch gears. What is a stress test? What a stress test does is essentially the same things that are mentioned earlier, an electrocardiogram and an echocardiogram and we take pictures of the heart and EKGs of the heart while the patient is at rest. And then we get the patient on a treadmill and get them to walk faster or as hard as they can. And then we take pictures and EKGs and images of their heart when their heart is pumping at 100 beats per minute or 150 beats per minute, 160 beats per minute while the heart is under stress. And that's why we call it a stress test. <coughs> what we do the majority of time. Um, we get the patients on a treadmill, we start the treadmill at a slow rate, at a slow pace, and we ramp up the speed and the incline to get the patient's heart rate as high as the patient can tolerate and let them exercise as far as they can until they get short of breath or they develop symptoms. 
Why do we do that? Not because we want to torture patients, but because we want to know what their symptoms are or what their, what we call functional class is. As you know, if you have a patient that can run for 15 minutes on the treadmill, believe me, their prognosis and their future is a lot brighter than somebody that can walk only two minutes or three minutes on the treadmill and starts developing crushing chest pain. And everything that I'm saying, all those data, is backed by many, 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 many years of patient data, patients that cannot walk far on the treadmill or that have chest pain during exercise, they tend not to do so well. And that's why we try to figure out exactly what is causing their symptoms and address those issues. Sometimes patients can have abnormal stress tests and they need catheterizations, tests that I'm going to talk about, and need you know, further intervention with regards to modifying and bringing their risks you know, down. Most of the stress tests, or we start, we tend to start, if the electrocardiogram at rest is normal, we do what we call a treadmill EKG stress test. And then if we need some form of imaging, we do a stress echo or a treadmill echo stress test, we call it. If the patient cannot exercise, and we see a fair number of patients that come to our office and they say, I have no idea how far I can exercise if it wasn't for my left knee. My left knee is killing me. I can't walk a block. I can go up a flight of stairs. So what do you do with those patients? Well, what we do nowadays is we use injections of different substances or chemicals that essentially imitate or put the heart at a state that is very similar to the state when the heart is exercising or when we are running or swimming or jogging. One of them is Persantin, another one is Lexiscan, and this is a newer one. Something else, adenosine or dobutamine, which we don't use them as much nowadays because they have a few side effects, um, <coughs> are being phased out a little bit. The most common one, ones are Persantin and Lexiscan. And we do those tests here in this center as well. With regards to the nuclear imaging, we use a camera. What is that? Big name, nuclear. Well, actually, we do use radioisotopes, radioactive material, scary stuff, right? Well, it's not that scary because it breaks down within 24 to 48 hours, and it clears out from our body. So if you were to have a stress test, a nuclear stress test, let's say here, now, and then two hours later you would go to the airport, one of the screeners in there very likely will pick up and say, ooh, you have nuclear material on you, what's going on, <laughs> right? But if you were to go to the airport two, three days later, they would pick up nothing, okay? It clears from your body very quick, very soon. This is one of the old nuclear cameras. It's kind of scary. I would get claustrophobic if I were to go through that camera, right? Well, technology. This is the newer cameras, completely open. You just sit in there, and this two little things in here are the camera that take pictures of the patient's heart. This is the machine that we have in here. That's why I put it in there. So what we do with the nuclear stress test, we inject a very tiny dose of nuclear material that has the affinity to go into the heart muscle. Now, if the coronary arteries are wide open, at rest and wide open and the blood flow to the heart is exactly the same at rest or at peak exercise, then we would not see any problems or any mismatches on those two sets of pictures. Now, if the demand for blood at rest is low, as it's supposed to, and then you get the patient to exercise and you tell them run as far as you can, as much as you can until your heart gets to 150, and the demand for blood in the heart increases, but the supply cannot match that demand because there is a narrowing or a blockage in there, then we start seeing discrepancies on the images between the rest images and the stress images. And this is one of those tests. If you look, <coughs> 
if, if you look at this part in here, there is no signal. The normal signal should be bright yellow, like this wall in here. But on this portion of the heart, there is nothing, no radioisotopes picked up in there. That's a problem. Very likely there is a very narrowed vessel in that area or a blocked artery that is not letting the radioisotope get to that part of the heart muscle. And the same here, you know, the same here in this image, you can see the mismatch. And again, these are different, you know, sets of images essentially telling us that, hey, doc, there is a problem in here. This patient needs to be taken seriously. Switching gears a little bit. I don't know if you have heard of a heart scan or calcium score or calcium scan, et cetera. This is essentially a CAT scan. I'm sure that, you know, you have heard patients getting CAT scans for their lungs or their knees or their hips or their bellies, et cetera. This is the same CAT scan that is done, but we measure something else. We measure the calcium amount within their coronary arteries or around their coronary arteries. What we saw when the CAT scan mach machines started coming to the market many years ago, the radiologists started noticing that within the heart, you would see these bright spots. And the cardiologist said, hmm, what does that mean? Well, that means calcium buildup in the coronary arteries. Well, it sounds like coronary artery disease because we know that atherosclerosis starts with a little bit of soft plaque, a little bit of cholesterol buildup, and then in advanced stages, that soft plaque becomes calcified. So this calcium buildup in here equals coronary artery disease. Simple test, 10, 15 minutes, patient goes on the table, gets a scan, gets out of the table, and we're able to see what's going on. If a patient comes to me and says, listen, my family, everybody in my family has coronary artery disease, but I can run a marathon, no problem. Well, I'm like, well, you can run a marathon, so your functional state is excellent, is great, better than mine. But your family history is very strong. Where do we go from here? How can I predict how can I start, you know, figuring out what the risk of this patient is for the future. Well, if someone is at intermediate risk for developing coronary artery disease, this is one of the tests that cardiologists use to figure out what their risk is. And it doesn't really matter if they are 40 years old. If they have a CAT scan like this that shows a lot of calcium, they have coronary artery disease. So it doesn't matter. I'm not going to discourage this patient from running the marathon but I would for sure intervene and try to bring their risks as low as possible, checking their cholesterol, making sure that they have a you know, well-balanced diet, low in cholesterol, low in salt, etc. So the previous image, this image is still being used nowadays. It's a very simple test. We just scanned the heart. And we've been doing this for more than 15 years, I would say. On this decade, 2001, looking forward, we went from doing just a plain CAT scan using only one camera to using more cameras and using contrast, injecting contrast into the patient's arms and waiting for that contrast to go to the heart <coughs> to look in more detail. And instead of one camera, we added initially 12 and then 16 and then 32 now, almost every hospital has a 64 camera CAT scan. Some of them already have cameras that have 128 heads. And some of the institutions within the United States of America have 356. It's getting kind of out of control. Why do we use so many cameras? Because it's like having black and white TV from the 1950s versus HD TV of today the image quality gets so much better. And nowadays, with a CAT scan, even with a 64 or the 128 slice CAT scan, the image quality is so good that we can see in detail their coronary artery disease. This white things, we can see the aorta right here and where the coronary artery starts, how it looks, is there plaque, is there thickening, is there calcium, is there a blockage, 
If patients were to have had a stent in the past, is that stent open or closed? So it gives us a lot more in detail information with just putting one single little IV line in their arm and spending essentially 30 minutes in the laboratory if their heart is at target, et cetera. So the amount of detail is a lot. Yes? <laughs> no. Oh, no. This is just a regular, I'm sure, you know, you have seen, you have drawn blood, for example. Yeah. When you give up blood, then you put a small IV line in the arm. That is all the invasion. That's it. They just put an IV line in here and they inject contrast through the IV line. There are a few things that we need to work before they inject the contrast, like the heart rate. If a patient walks in in the laboratory with a heart rate of, let's say, 80 or 90, and they are very anxious about what the test is going to be like, sometimes we have to prep the patient. And prepping the patient, getting the patient ready for the test itself can be a lot longer than the test itself. So sometimes we have to wait for two or three hours and we give them medication like beta blockers, like metoprolol, et cetera, to bring their heart rate down to about 60 beats per minute because the image quality is better. What kind of dye do you use? The same dye or very similar dye that is used on the catheterizations. Which is? Which is fizzy pack. Is that a nuclear dye? It, it is not a nuclear material, okay, but it is an iodine-based, iodine correct. But no, it doesn't include, you know, there is no nuclear. If you were to have stents in there to do this test, <coughs> do you learn something or do you see them? Or how, how if there is suspicion that those stents might be narrowed or anything, sometimes, yeah, we do use this test. Because many times after a period of time, stenosis develops ahead of a stent, right? Yes. It so can if learning to do the test even if you have stents in it. So you, you mentioned the word radiation, nuclear material. So the CAT scan, every kind of X-ray or CAT scan involves radiation. The good news is that the amount of radiation is small. Right. So the amount of, just to give you an idea, a comparison, if you were to get an X-ray, the amount of radiation that you are exposed through that X-ray is like being in the sun for like two days, sun bathing for two days. The CAT scan is a little bit higher. This is like taking a trip or a flight from New York, let's say, down to Florida. So it has a little bit more radiation. Is it high? No. So it's an X-ray. Iodine is a contrast dye. Correct. And then an X-ray to, <coughs> to obtain the images. Yes. So a surgeon afterwards could tell exactly where to go in terms of blockages? Some of the surgeons do, especially most of the surgeons can, can draw, you know, all the data that they need through an echocardiogram, mm -hmm. which is an ultrasound, no radiation, no nuclear material involved. Now, if a patient is born with a congenital abnormality, some of the surgeons ask for this specific test to see exactly how the heart is rotated or how the vessels are, where they are, how do they look in what kind of shape before they even go in there for an intervention. Just a yes? Uh, is this test considered part of the vascular test that you would run or are those different? Some, some, you know, again, vascular is a very, you know, it's a term that includes many, many, many pathologies, many different things. But, but, it, but in related to the heart. It is related to the heart. It looks at coronary artery disease. There are doctors that use exactly the same machine to image their carotid arteries, the patient's carotid arteries. Some doctors use it to image the vessels that run down in our body, like aorta, like femoral arteries, okay? to see if there are blockages, and if there are blockages, what's the best way to approach it. So this is the CAT scan that I'm talking about, and within this machine, there are between 64 and 128 cameras. And when the patient sits in this table and goes through this machine, it move, the patient moves about between 15 and 20 centimeters within that machine. 
and that machine spins around and takes all the pictures that we need to obtain. And all the images are, you know, transferred, all the data are transferred to a computer and then into a monitor and we can see the pretty images. Switching gears, heart catheterization. I had a different picture, but since it's Go Red for Women today, I borrowed this from the American Heart Association. It's in their website. All the tests that I'm talking about, if you, you know, Google heart tests, American Heart Association, I am sure you will see, you know, plenty of information to get out. American College of Cardiology has their own website called CardioSmart. If you Google the term CardioSmart, it will bring you to their patient-oriented website that talks about all the heart medical problems. So heart catheterization, what it is and what we will use it for. Uh, if a patient were to have chest pain and go to the emergency room and say, you know, I'm having severe chest pain, we do an electrocardiogram or an echocardiogram and we see a problem in there that the heart is not working well. If our level of suspicion is high for a blocked artery, what we do, we send the patient for a catheterization. Sounds scary, but it's a simple test. For sure, it has a few risks. But if you look at the benefits or the reasons why we're doing this test and you compare it to the risks, the risks are very small and the benefits are high, okay? It's an invasive test. Most of the time, we go through the femoral artery within the groin area, left or right, we find the artery, we numb the area, and what most of the patients, despite their anxiety about going through the test, et cetera, what they feel is like a needle stick right before we numb their you know, area. Once the groin is numb, it's unlikely that they will feel any other symptom during this test. They are awake. A lot of patients can see the monitor and what the doctor is doing. We as doctors like to communicate and talk to the patient and say, how are you doing? Are you feeling anything? The balloon is up. Are you having any chest pain? The stent is deployed. We're done. So what we do, we get a catheter, a small catheter, this green thin tube right here. This is the catheter. So we go from the groin up to the aorta and we find the origin or the beginning of the coronary arteries and we inject a small amount of similar iodine contrast within the coronary arteries and we look for blockages. Once we find and we see where this blockage is, we can get a very thin flexible wire through that blockage and get there with a very tiny balloon, inflate the balloon and open this blocked artery. If a patient shows up in the emergency room nowadays, we try to bring them in the cath lab if they are having a heart attack from a clogged artery, we try to bring them up in the cath lab within one hour. The earlier we bring them in the cath lab, the better the outcomes. Less patients die, the less problems they have because the blood starts going where it's supposed to. And again, if we were to find a clogged artery like this one, all this stuff in here, all this junk is like a clot, platelets that have stuck together and block the blood flow. Right in here where this black mark it is, this is the vessel magnified in here. So we can go through this blockage with a thin wire and open it up. Most of the time, or more than 90% of the time, when we go with the wire in there, open it up, we put a stent. The stents are pieces of metal, very, very thin metal. <clears throat> no one can feel that they have a stent in their heart, okay? Stents stay in there to reinforce the heart vessel wall so that that wall doesn't collapse in itself. The stents in the United States have been used for at least, I'd say, starting from the time that they were still in trial, I'd say 10 years. In Europe, probably between 10 and 12 years. We have a lot of experience. I know that there has been a lot of talk on the news about stents, what's good, what's bad, etc. My advice for all of you would be let your doctor give you whatever you know the options are, and make a decision, of course, together with you. There are two types of stents, drug-eluted or coated stents and bare metal stents. The outcomes from both of them are very, very similar. Okay? So as I said, talk to your doctor. Don't just, you know, say one stent is much better than the other because it is not the case. Any qu Yes? 
<coughs> that is the LED. This one? Where or the one below? I don't know in my case. Which These are the diagonals. Well, if one of those is more okay. vessels, yes. uh, it's on the side of the stem. Mm -hmm. The stem blocks it. So no more flow into that vessel, small vessel. Mm -hmm. What are the implications? How long does it take to get into an equilibrium situation? It's a little hard to predict, but the good news is that our heart and all our blood vessels are like city streets, okay? Think of this LED that I said, or the main branches, like the main highways. And then you have the city streets, or the exits, right? right. If you were to block the highway, there is some blood actually being rerouted and going around and being sent downstream where this muscle you know, is. And we call them collateral vessels. But very often, those collateral vessels are much smaller than the main branch, and that's when heart attacks, etc., happen. So we really worry, and what we try to open is the main branch. Sometimes as the vessel is really tiny and really small, the area or the part of the muscle that it supplies is very small. But if you were to block the main branch, you can think that two-thirds of the heart muscle can have a problem. Further down the branch you go, if you were to block it here, very likely the amount of heart muscle that will end up, you know, dead, it's much smaller. And don't get me wrong, putting a stent in the heart doesn't mean that the coronary artery disease is gone, okay? It's like a plow machine. When the snow falls, you move the snow on the side of the road. There is no way for us. Unfortunately, we haven't figured it out how to melt all that plaque or cholesterol or whatever is going on in the heart. That's why the patients, when they come in with a heart attack, leave the hospital with about five or six different medications, which are medications that have been shown to lower their you know, risk for having another heart attack, morbidity, mortality, etc. Thank you. You're welcome. This is the cardiac MRI, similar to the CTA, or the chest coronary angiography. I just put an image in here. It employs a big MRI machine as well. We use this when we want to know how the heart is pumping. It gives us slightly better images than the echocardiogram. Unfortunately, this test to be done needs about, you know, between 40 minutes at least to an hour to go through. And most of the time, one echocardiogram is more than enough. But a small number of patients need to have cardiac MRIs because sometimes we need more information than what the echocardiogram is giving us. Holter monitor, I just put it in here because a lot of patients have heard about Holter monitors. What this is, is essentially a portable EKG machine, a portable electrocardiographic machine. It has a couple of electrodes right in here and has a little monitor that the patients carry with them around. Depends, you know, for about 24 hours sometimes. Some patients carry it around for two days. Other patients can carry it around for a month. Nowadays, those monitors, with the technology and cell phones and wireless, et cetera, improving, have advanced to the point that the second that the patient experiences an arrhythmia, the monitor sends a signal wirelessly to a nurse or a physician sitting somewhere in a room, I don't know where in the United States, and they can see exactly what kind of pathology, what kind of problem they have. As a matter of fact, Dr. Graham at the end of the room in here had a patient that had an arrhythmia that at two in the morning, he had 20 second pause. So his heart was beating, 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 and then it stopped. An awful long time, right? His heart wasn't beating. 20 seconds. So, what happened? 
The nurse that was just looking at the monitor picks up the phone, calls the family. Their phone rings at 2 a.m. and says, go and wake up your father. So they woke up their father, and the heartbeat, thank God, came back. He came in the hospital, got a pacemaker, and he went back home the next day. So again, the technology has evolved. We started with Dr. Do you remember that first image from Netherlands with that huge machine, right? So in 100 years, we moved from that huge machine to an iPhone that a doctor puts in his chest and can see exactly the same thing what Dr. Winhoven was seeing 100 years ago, right? Now we can check blood pressures. Some manufacturers are selling cuffs that you can hook up to an iPhone and measure your blood pressure. You know, I wonder where we will be 10, 15, 50 years or 100 years from now. We'll probably will have, you know, the magic ball in there. We'll touch that ball, and that ball will tell us, mm, you are at risk for coronary artery disease, heart attacks, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. Questions? What about artificial hearts? Uh, what, do, what do you see for those? Say it again. Artificial. The future, artificial hearts. What are those? Artificial, artificial hearts. Artificial. Oh, okay. So I thought it was another test. Okay. Artificial hearts. Yeah, we are using them more and more nowadays, okay? Before, we used to, to, to and we still use it actually, the term extracorporeal circulation. We would put two tubes, one in the artery, one in the vein, and the blood was being pumped out of the body back into, you know, the system and thrown into the aorta, etc. Now we have moved from the huge machines and we have squeezed them into a hard size machine. And actually, Dick Cheney has one. His heart doesn't work. He has a metal heart. He's cold-hearted to begin with. <laughs> so if he's alive, they are doing something good, right? Is it coming, is it coming to the point where that would be the, op the first option? Than the the first option? Yeah. No. To put an artificial heart on a patient, we think like it takes months probably before we make the decision and we take that step. You trade one problem for another. For another. So you want to make sure that your heart is really shot. And yeah, but it, Cheney started having heart disease in his 30s, and he's been through five surgeries, <laughs> stents, and defibrillators, and LVAD, and so he has all kinds of other things that he went through way before they got to that point. So it's, uh, it is trading one problem for another, but we're actually moving and doing a lot better. Um, Penn is actually in the top three programs as far as transplant and um, LVAD, left ventricular <coughs> device, and development of artificial heart. So again, it's a, it's a great place, but it's uh, top three in the country as far as that's concerned. But we're working on that. It's not quite there in terms of as a first step, but um, certainly there's a lot of things that we can do way before that. Once a patient's heart has completely failed, that's the time when we start talking either transplant or an artificial heart. And because the available hearts, the number of available hearts for transplant is so small, so low, now we have, you know, started using a lot more of artificial hearts. Yep, and they are getting better. They are getting a lot better than what they used to. Oh yeah, no question, no doubt about it. Dick Cheney, the real example, yeah. <laughs> yes. What's the current thinking about lasering? I remember that was hot. So yeah, laser was really hot until a few years ago. What laser is, is just like a high energy beam and we would go with a catheter up to the heart, find the area where the patient had, had had a heart attack and we would start making holes with this high energy beam within that heart muscle thinking that if we make holes more blood will flow into that area so the heart muscle will regenerate. And then some institution took it to the next level well, on top, where on top of the laser and making those holes they started injecting stem cells within the heart muscle. Unfortunately, it hasn't, you know, come to fruition. You know, it hasn't been shown that it makes a difference. Yes? How do you monitor a known coronary artery disease? Um, 
particularly after a heart attack? By talking to your doctor. Warning signs like symptoms by taking your medications. If your doctor says, listen, you need to lose weight and exercise more, they mean it. It's not about just like, ah, I wasn't the doctor. He told me again the same story that I've heard for the last 20 years. Okay? Exercise more, eat less, and don't tell me that, oh, but I eat so little. The question is about, you know, how much you're eating and how much you're burning. It's not about, you know, what the quantity is. If you continue to gain weight with a small portion of food, it means that you're exercising very, very little for saying none. So the amount of calories that you're burning is not enough to burn whatever you're consuming. So if you were thinking maybe of testing, what kind of test do you need after a heart attack? So like a stress no, test? Like, are, are you using any of these to verify whether it's progressing or regressing? So we don't use tests by default on a patient that has no symptoms. Because once a patient has coronary artery disease, we take them very seriously and we like to use every single tool in our hands to address that issue. But if a patient starts complaining of new chest pain or new symptoms, then we use you know, different modalities, sometimes stress tests, sometimes just the treadmill EKG, sometimes a nuclear stress test or a stress echocardiogram. Some patients that still have questionable tests or their symptoms are questionable need CTAs or some patients that have, you know, seriously enough symptoms, we send them for a catheterization where we go with the catheter and we take a second look at their coronary arteries. So all these tests are used to, to diagnose or see, you know, and look for a progression of their disease. Well, how many of you enjoyed yourself today?